information, we're in for fun. Most importantly, we're in for networking. If you don't know me, my name is Lori Power and I'm a group benefit consultant. My, my number one job for my clients is to be consistent. And one of those consistencies is being able to give information to people from the source. I want, I want people to grow. I want people to be successful. And I want people to network with the right people so that they can take their experiences and blossom from that. From that. So I'm really, really pleased to welcome Dennis Mosley Williams, who had answered my LinkedIn probe of saying, hey, Dennis, I have this dinky little show and I'd really like you to come on. And he said, yeah, okay. <laughs> what does that say about you, Dennis? You no, know, funnily enough, nice to, nice to see you all, by the way. Um, funnily enough, just earlier this morning, I was chatting with my friend, Dan, we were talking about luck. I wrote all these blogs on getting lucky. My friend, Dan, Daniel Crosby, he's written some books on behavioral finance. And I said, actually, you know, there's studies on getting lucky. Okay. In fact, they like take two groups of people, lucky people, people who identify as being lucky. I'm a lucky person. And other people who identify as like nothing but misery happens to me. Okay. And if there's anybody here, I pity you. Because the, like the second one, it's like, ha, ha, can you imagine really being that way though? Mm, I'm My mother-in-law is that way. My mother-in-law is a whole, oh, it's Murphy's law. Right. So. Okay. Well, get this. They ask these two groups of people, this question. They say, I want you to imagine this absolutely awful scenario where you go to the bank and while you're there, it gets robbed and you get shot, not killed, but shot. Like, can you believe it? You want that happens. How would you feel about that? And all of the lucky people who, who identified as being lucky said, well, I know this is a little crazy, but probably I think, wow, what an experience. Okay. Which is an interesting take on that. Here's what the people who identified as being unlucky said, that'd be just my luck. They all said it like, that'd be me. Okay. So they're studying their traits then like, wow, these are, some of these people got shot and looked at it as kind of an interesting thing, possibly positive. The others were like, well, that, that would happen to me, which is really interesting, right? So they look at what they all do in behavior. And the very first thing that lucky people do that unlucky people don't, they say yes more often. So if somebody asks me, hey, can you tune into this meeting? And there's no reason why I can't, given that if I was in the middle of writing a book right now, I probably would have said, no, I, I absolutely can. You have no idea where all my minutes are going. But as it is, I have time. I'll say yes. I'll enjoy it. I might get lucky. <laughs> it also means you'll go to cocktail parties you wouldn't otherwise go to. Think about it. Hey, does anybody want to come to a party with me? It's just my friends. It's just you and me. Oh, and all of these people, they're, they're just do this. They all do one thing that you don't do. And they're really nerdy and geeky, but if you don't want to go, I wouldn't blame you, but I'll be there and I'll have a pint with you. Most people would say, I'm going to watch Netflix and perhaps chill. But lucky people go, yeah, what the hell? And that's how they say, and that's when I met so-and-so and they're now my best friend and we've been doing this together. And then we started a business and made a million dollars. Well, it's been it's an amazing time to say yes. And I, I'm very fortunate. All the people in this room said yes. So when I invited them out to, to come and see you, they said yes. And this is the experience. When you say yes, just to segue into that, when you say yes, you open yourself up to the experience. And the experience that we have as business owners is wanting to provide that same positive experience, in my opinion, to our clients. Take us through your, your take on those experiences. Take us through the experience shift. Take us through what we are supposed to have when 2020 socked us in the guts. Take us through what our experience shift is going to look like. Going forward, well, as some of you know from, from following the things that I write about and speak about, we started on this in the, in the green room, so to speak, on the idea of connection. So where the shift has gone now with the world going digital as it's accelerated towards where it was going in the first place. When this first came in, I was asked by friends in my world, did this just kill you? Like you're the experience economy guy. Has this just killed the experience economy? Has the whole business just effectively become Amazon? And I argued, no, absolutely not. No, it, it's advanced it. Here's where it's going. Hyper-personalization and the next 
shift up the progression of economic value beyond experiences is leading very much to guided transformations, meaning services are delivered, experiences are staged, and transformations are guided. What consumers and clients and all of us ask now when we're measuring value, who is this person, what does this business bring me, et cetera, is, you know, what's this worth? The question we're asking is, who are they helping me become? So when you started, Lori, with who are you connecting and what are you doing? It's like, well, you can look at this two ways. It, looking at the progression of economic value. Information is the commodities of it, yeah? Opinions are the goods, yeah? Re sharing said opinions either via, not Zoom, but via Zoom or conferences or magazine articles or newsletters people can read is the service. The staged experience is Lori gathering people together in a space digital that has meaning and through different kind of um, connection, guiding everybody on the call to a new awareness. So the, the question is, who are you helping them become? What conversation are you starting? What tension are you creating? Dan Crosby, I wish I wrote the damn thing down. He gave me this great quote today. Some famous psychologist we all know, literally, I'm going to have to follow up with him because I thought that belongs in a presentation. And it was like the only value we really bring is when we make another person uncomfortable. So the shift with all of our work and all of our purpose is to ask ourselves, who do they want to become? What's the, what's, what do they care about? What's the challenge? And how can I solve that? And it, the answer might not have anything to do with our goods and services. I recently have, had heard a, a speaker from the United States and, and he said something very eloquent. He said, change is an art form. Mm -hmm. Resistance is a science. And when we delved into that change, how we adapt to that change in whatever environment we have been given ourselves mm -hmm. is an art. It's unique to us and how we're going to, to uh, accommodate Resistance, though, is the science. And segueing back to what you said it originally, are we yes people? Are we maybe people? Are we no people? Mm -hmm. And that is the science of people. And knowing who we are can help us motivate and transition through. Well, and I said to my wife all the time, I talk fast. I think really slow. <laughs> well, when you and I first met, you talked to me about, um, about Starbucks. And you said, mm -hmm. you know, people don't go to Starbucks for, for the coffee, the coffee costs the same as if we're going to Timmy's or wherever. We go to Starbucks for the experience. What yeah. makes me a Starbucks customer over a Tim's customer? As you know, those are two. So here it is. Those are two separate offerings. One sells coffee and one sells something totally different. One of them sells coffee as fast as you can get it. Although I'm going to point this out. I'm just going to get this off my chest. No, they don't. They sell coffee as slow as possible. My God, that is a painful experience from a service standpoint. Tim Hortons, you're literally only like it because your mom and dad didn't hold you enough when you were a kid and you suffer and you still think you deserve it. They employ 87 people. They all look the exact same. They stand behind the counter. They're all caught over bumping into each other like bad AI in a video game over by the drive through window. And then they give you a coffee that's still too hot and spills on your pants 90% of the time. Having said that, they have a loyal cultish following and they sell coffee as fast as they can through your drive through window. Starbucks, on the other hand, sells something totally different. They sell connection, community, and identity. And it, you, you can say, oh my God, this guy, he'll believe anything. Nope. There's two... When Tim Hortons wakes up in the morning and pulls his brown polyester on, it has a question, a burning question. How are we going to sell more coffee today? They value price it. They bundle it up with food. They let, you, they let you get it through the window at the side of the store. They'll do anything they can. They sell it for as cheap as they can. That's not just a different market. That's a different offering with different sensibilities. When you go to Starbucks, everything costs more. That's fine. What are people really buying there? When Starbucks rolls out of bed in the morning, they have a different burning question. And that burning question is, how are we going to make everybody who comes in here feel like they own it? 
They have a mission statement, which is to inspire the human spirit, one sip, one cup, one neighborhood at a time. But they have this theme, this purpose behind their business, which is home, work, Starbucks. Their observation being that everybody here on our Zoom call owns two things, their house and their job. Everything else they just use. They just use services. And if you're selling services, you will compete on price. There is no way I couldn't buy something from you today that you would have charged me more for 10 years ago. <laughs> okay, that's the way it is. So he is, Starbucks via Howard Schultz is drawn, is driven by an entirely different purpose. People go to Starbucks, they get an experience, they get hyper-personalization. What's customization? How do you want your coffee? I'll make it that way for you. With some sacrifice though, can you make it this way or this way? Can you put a pump of vanilla in there? No, the person says it's Starbucks. <clears throat> All right, Tim Horn's having a butt right behind the counter. They may as well. It's horrible, okay? But at Starbucks, there's 80,000 possible ways for them to not only make your coffee the way you want it, personalize, they sneak their butts outside. Now, Lori, can I just go back a minute? You can. Okay, so, so you the second thing you say you said was about people and knowing who we are, right? So you're giving me a thought on happy, and then you're looking at me like, I was like, well, was that a question? I just thought that was an awesome point, Lori. <laughs> just thinking about what you just said as it relates to this thing called the dip, which my partner in crime, Scott Webb, presented at our summit the other week. This, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this concept. So th that's what you got me thinking about. Then you followed up with your Starbucks question, but I can weave it back around. All right. So let's get to this idea of purpose and intention and what, what, what authenticity, which these things all get thrown around a lot. But a lot of people are just playing with them like cats. They're not really taking it in. They're just talking about it. The heart of the experience economy is authenticity. I'm honest with myself as to who I am, and I share myself as I am. I don't, I don't, it's real, real. As we say in the experience economy, that's the term we use, real, real. I'm going to give you an example of real, real. I'm real, real. Oh, can we go there? We can absolutely go there. Donald Trump is real, real. Uh -huh. Okay, what's Hillary Clinton? Perception. I, ha I admire her tremendously. Let me be very clear. And I think she got robbed. And I think she has a lot of class. I'm putting that right out there. I'm not picking on Hillary Clinton. Dig it. I like her very much. Kar karmically, she's got something coming her way. Hillary Clinton was perceived as being fake, fake. No. Real fake. She's true to herself. But there's something about her. I feel like she's lying to me. He was horrible. But told you so. Remember that New York, that New Yorker cartoon? The, all the sheep are looking at the sign and that the wolf is running for election. He says, I will eat you. <laughs> That's the slogan. And one of the sheep is saying to the others, he says it like it is. Authenticity. We know it and we are attracted to it, even if we don't necessarily want it. Okay authenticity is everything when i tell you about starbucks let's pretend you all own coffee shops and i told you about starbucks and believe me i can go deep on starbucks theme harmonizing cues evoking senses escapist language personalization customer secrets ah, a brand you buy into that is not a fluke that place that is evil crime lord genius place if i told you all about it and you said yeah I see why you could soak somebody four bucks for a coffee like that. Well, Laurel makes a good point on the Buckley's. I grew up with Buckley's. It tastes awful, but it works. And they weren't lying. That's exactly it. And they made that their thing, right? They didn't try and make it sweeter. That's a thing. And I get it. But one is, one is a culture. The other is a really good ad. That was a good ad. And it's authentic. And it's real. And they own it. If and it I, takes a lot of trust, too, to be authentic. We have to have not just a trust in our own audience, but a trust and in a, in a, a confidence in ourselves to be authentic, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. It can be really risky, for sure. It can well, be especially really in, a, in a judgmental social media society that we are. Jay, you had a question. Go ahead and unmute. 
I, I didn't actually have a question. I just was, I came in late and I wanted to know if, how we're supposed to be part of this, if we're supposed to be part of this. You're absolutely supposed to be part of it. Are you a Starbucks to... customer? I'm not a Starbucks customer, but I like where this is going in that, um, you know, it is about authenticity. Mm -hmm. And really, I don't have the memory to remember the way that I wasn't authentic to 87 different people. I'm not smart enough to do that. So it's just like, I'm just going to be me and you're going to like me or you're not. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Can I jump on that, Jay? So when you say, so let's start with authenticity. I want to stop, just clarify by saying this. If I told you about Starbucks, you own a coffee shop and your conclusion was, yeah, I can see why that would work and why you could soak somebody four bucks for a cup of coffee. I would tell you, don't do it. Your heart's not in it. Look what you just said. You didn't, if you said this, that is what I've been trying to explain to my business partner since we started. Then I would say this, <clears throat> rip it off. You believe in it, man. So let's go to authenticity and when we define ourselves through authenticity of our work, that's not the authenticity I'm talking about. I'm talking about becoming, we also, somebody said leadership. Early on, we said, who do your clients wanna become? And you said, uh, they wanna become leaders. So to which my question would be, perfect. Evolving into leaders from what? I can answer that. Also, sometimes my Zooms are great because I ask, I ask the questions, I give the answers. <laughs> No, you cannot be a leader and a manager. As I drum my fingers on my desk for effect. Nobody needs a manager. What do managers do? They just tell you what to do. They annoy. Is what they do. And you got to flatter them. They want to get last year's results done this year quicker, maybe cheaper than last year. Managers need authority. Dennis, do you have issues with authority? No. <laughs> Is there a reason you own your own show, D? I only ever had one boss I really loved and I was like a teenager and he pretty much taught me right away, you're gonna wanna own it. <laughs> okay. Leaders don't do that. Leaders take people with them. They don't need authority at all. They just take it. They just give it. They give authority. They say, you go own it. So when we say, let's get into authenticity, that was beautiful earlier when you said that they want to become leaders. It's like, yes, because then if that's something you yourself can support, and I say, well, my big question I ask my clients is what do your clients care about? So as I, I'm assuming, you know, but you might not know all my clients are in the financial service industry. Most of my individual clients own their own investment firms. They're in the United States and they manage at times like 9 billion. It's crazy. And there's four of them. Four guys in Chicago managing $9 billion. It's insane. I say, what do your clients care about? I have, it takes me forever to get them to stop talking about products or fees. No, 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 no. I am a business owner. I could be your client. You'd like to have me. What do I care about? No, I care that my kids think I suck. <laughs> really? Yeah. Formerly, I flew around a lot before the plague. I was always leaving. <laughs> the plague. <laughs> yeah. So if you're going to manage my money and you want me to pay you, this is where I'm going here. Yeah. You should teach me how to be a really good dad and an excellent communicator. I would really, really like that. And if you were thinking, you'd know that's what I'd be thinking about. You'd either ask me or determine that. So if we get into the idea of niches, right? That's why a niche market is really good because you can assume everybody like me is thinking about that. So if we go to authenticity and what your what your people care about, how who they want to be leaders, how do you make them a leader? That's your challenge. And if it's they want to be this or this, that's what you got to zero in on. Mike, folks, what's your competitive advantage, Dennis? Oh, all the other guys in my industry that do what I do are always trying to help them make more money. <laughs> yeah, I just try to make them have a better life. Generally speaking, the making more money will follow. But the happiness. How do you do that? How do you do that in the financial services? I mean, I do employee benefits. I guess we fall in the periphery. Yeah. But you know, how do you take somebody out of thinking about their products and services? I struggle with that. Laurel knows I struggle with with 
how clients or customers are perceiving my business, how people who come into the room are perceiving what the benefit is of, of coming together and networking. Mm -hmm. How do we engage that mindset? It's like sometimes, you know, as a leader, we know we're not afraid to fail, just as yep. you had, had said, you know, we're not afraid of the bruised knees and we know we're going to get up. We're tenacious. But how do we get into that mindset of understanding what our clients want to experience? Honest, I say this to my clients all the time. What you want to do is have two glasses of wine and go for a walk. <laughs> okay, go get into the right frame of mind. Well, so this is when it comes into being to authenticity. The I can't tell you the answer. I can tell you how to think about it. Okay, so if I said, no, 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 it all comes from inside. Dennis, what do you do again? In court, you want my answer I'm gonna to have to give you in court? No, I nobody's consult. allowed to sue you here. <laughs> okay, perfect. I consult on uh, business strategy. Yeah, once I help you figure out your idea, we build the business plan for you and help you implement it. Yeah, and we have a little bit of a thing for innovating around customer experience and design. Look at my long freaky fingers, by the way, uh, around customer experience and design. That's what I do in court, your honor. That's what I do. So your business consultants, yeah. That's it, nerdy business stuff, as I tell my wife all the time. What'd you do at work today? Nerdy business stuff, how are the kids? So, what do my clients want? Okay, what do you really do? What's this serious shift thing about, Dave? What's that all about? It's like, oh, that's what they really want. I've subsumed the service of business consulting up into a way bigger offering, which is what? Meaningful, lasting change in your life forever. Okay, zeroing in on your own authentic self, writing your life manifesto and li living a life less ordinary. What's this? This is where we're going, Lori. This is for you. You're in my top left corner, by the way. You're right there. Right. Does that hurt at all? Nothing? A little, oh, you yeah. hit me. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear that? Yeah. So uh, here's the secret. I know that I use my business to teach, my position to teach. Okay, you ready? They're, they're miserably unhappy. Oh my God, they make so much money. It makes on paper, they should be Keith Richards. What the hell is going on? Where you should be living a never ending buffet of freak show happiness. What the hell is wrong with you? Oh, I don't own a business. I own a job. And I never asked myself the questions about who I really am and what I want to be. So I learned, I'm 49 years old, but I speak at a 56 year old level. Um, I'm 49 and I started working in this business when I was 23 and believe it or not, the first guy that I ever spoke to and all, you know, when you're brand new and your brand new job and you go way, way back can you, and you just want to make a sale to get your boss off your back, your new guy who's making sure you know what the hell you're doing. The first guy I ever made a sale to in my entire life, Edmonton, Alberta. <laughs> okay. Well. Yeah. I cannot tell you his name, but in the United States, I say his name all the time so people know he's real, first and last. I sold him a $500 doodad 25 years ago, a marketing toolkit kind of thing. But he was saying all the right things and doing all the right things and blah, 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 blah. And I thought, oh, he might want to be a consulting client of ours. Oh, wouldn't that just throw my new boss and forever get the man off my back here? Wouldn't that be great? So I get to the point where I have him fill out a questionnaire and he writes on the questionnaire something he did last year that he was so proud of was he finally made $100,000. And I thought, yes, he can afford this $5,000 thing. I'm going to uh, maybe get to sell him. Okay, and this is totally like look behind the curtain. So I'm thrilled. And I flip through this questionnaire that used to come in on a fax machine because <laughs> this was before email, unless you were Al Gore. I look, I look to his assets under management. He was life insurance too, was 4 million under management. And I went, what? Crushed. Because my company I was working for then wouldn't work with anybody who had less than 50. Wow. So I lose my first big deal. Oh, I'm crushed. And then I say to my boss, how much money do our clients make? Like if Buddy just made a hundred and he's not even, I shouldn't even be on the phone with him according to you. How much does that guy I talked to yesterday make? And without even looking me in the eye, I'm an impressionable young 20 something year old dude. He goes like this. Anywhere between let's say 
500,000 and $2 million US and keeps typing. And the very first thought I had was, they're all pricks. That was the first thing I thought. What? How come I haven't met a nice guy yet? How come there hasn't been a single solitary person who I thought I want to grow up and be just like you? Except that guy. <laughs> Ironically, what a nice man. Okay, so let's get into this idea of authenticity and how we get there. What's your secret? If your client doesn't say, you know, Andrea, I'm desperate to be a leader. We're just going to keep staying on this one. Then your task is to know that. Okay, they don't know what they want. So that becomes yours. Well, I know everybody needs to become a leader. That's what I know. I know I could come in and just talk to these people about business stuff. And blah, 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 blah. But if I talk to them about life, purpose, what it's all about and living a better life, they'll really buy into me as their consultant and they'll do all this other stuff. It's something real, real. I have to believe. I have a, uh, a worldview that I share. There's a million other people in the financial service industry who do the technical services that my partner Tom and I offer. And they're all awesome. It's not like if you're like, oh no, what am I gonna do? This guy's turning me right off. I don't wanna ever work with him. Oh, don't worry. There's 50 million other people that know as much as us or maybe more. They're just as good of it. They've worked with clients forever. They have references and testimonials and they're awesome and they have no personality or one you'll like more or whatever and you'll find them. This idea you said earlier, Lori, of you gotta really trust yourself to be yourself, you do because we're all undoing lousy programming that's been put into our brain since we were five years old and first showed up in kindergarten. And we learned right away to fit in. <laughs> they sat us in rows. You learned really quickly not to ask too many questions. I still don't understand. What are you, dumb? Like you figured that out. And then we all, like, I'm not even joking. We went all the way through school learning something. Fit in, do what you're told. Don't be a ruckus in the classroom. Your teacher was just a, tut a tutor for your future boss. By the time we were 18, we were completely programmed to let somebody tell us what to do and to learn. If you don't rock the boat, you'll actually get further. You'll get promoted. Don't share that good idea. Don't put your hand up and say, hey, boss, this is a better idea. So I'm going to bring this around to you. Uh, maybe some of you know Kevin McFadden in Winnipeg. Doesn't Kevin McFadden do what you guys do? Isn't he a benefits guy? Isn't that technically how he gets paid? Isn't that what he would say in court? Right. <sighs> if you're going to make me say it, I do retirement and health benefit plans for companies. <laughs> Not everybody in the room does what I do. Whatever. <laughs> That's what he does. If you do it, you know what it is. If you don't, you can imagine. It's paperwork. He does paperwork. Thanks, it's just, Isn't it, Andrew? It's just paint drawing on the wall. <laughs> it's totally necessary, but it's blah. And he knows it. So here's his thing. Look the guy up. What's his bag? His bag is personal development and well-being and thinking, right? The guy, I shouldn't be outing him like this. He spends tens of thousands of dollars a year attending conferences. He'll walk the coals. He's in. He's one of those guys. And I've met him at a conference. He shows up at eight o'clock in the morning, stays till eight o'clock at night, takes notes all day. He is a personal development, it looks for inspiration every day. He's one of my favorite people on earth, okay? His entire business is about teaching what he believes to clients. So when he signs a company up, he then starts to work with the HR department. He convinces them that they need to have a community garden for their employees and a bank of bicycles. Just go buy them. Let your employees just take them and go riding. And, and it'll lead to community. And here, these are these vending machines that I own. Here, I'm just gonna put these in your building. You pay to stock them. Here's the list of stuff you have to stock them with. You're not allowed to put a, a cliff bar in there. That's just a Mars bar with a different bag on it. It has to be healthy stuff. He goes in and takes over your culture. Some guy, person, is mindlessly trying to compete with him right now, offering those companies a better, deal financially do you think they care about saving a little bit of money would you give up the kevin show he has a symposium every year on wellness i've spoken at it this year he brought in one of the guys that was the argentinian soccer team the crowd or chilean soccer team perhaps that crashed in the andes and damn near had to eat each other i gather he brought him in 
I think I've got a bag of the coffee from the show here somewhere. Yeah, he's an inspiring guy and he's able to pull that off because it comes from inside. It's who he is. It's amazing. And my mind is going in 4 million directions. I'd invest in AW, by the way. I've been looking at it. That is not. Look at your own financials. But I'm an experienced economy guy. I was in North Bay, Ontario. That's my hometown. And la, 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 I ended up at A&W. I even thought, oh my God, I never do this. Fast food. Right away, I like the look of the place. I put it through my experience economy frameworks as I experienced their drive through. I saw the little inside thing. I was like, oh, these guys are positioned to rock. Who's hometown? Well, you're from there? Wait a second. Car. I went to school with some cars. I went to school with Cameron Car. Is he a relative of yours? No, nope, but uh, you're, um, my mom knows your mom. Oh, that's nice yeah. to hear. Yeah. She says to send you her best. Oh, your mom's a love. Thanks. That's yeah, why I was in North Bay. The yeah. A&W is near the hospital. That's why I did there. That was my discovery. My mom checked out a few weeks ago on me, everybody. She was 87 years old. No sadness here other than I like love her large. And you would be, and I'm sad, and you would be too if your mom was my mom. She was totally awesome, okay? This is what she told me on my, on like lying there. when At her condo, it was beautiful. She goes, well, Dennis, she says, uh, work hard. No, live your life, work hard, but don't kill yourself, but make sure you contribute. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? That's that told. is awesome. What, an, what a wonderful legacy <laughs> to leave you with. What she made friends her whole life. Totally awesome lady. Yeah, loved her. Okay, I'm curious um, to start on this journey of like bringing our authentic selves to the work that we're doing. What kind of questions should I start asking myself to explore, um, you know, how I connect with, and it's funny you bring up Kevin McFadden because as I'm building my business, I do the same thing as Lori. Um, I, I look to Kevin as, and I've never met him, Mm -hmm. Um, but I look to what he's doing as something that I aspire to. So, um, but yeah, so, so help me start myself down this path okay. in a really tactical way. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. What is it? What about your work is hard? Not hard to do. That's not what I mean. I mean, what's the toughest part about your job? I asked my friend that who's a police officer, and the very first thing she said was notifying next of kin without hesitation. Something I had never considered. Like, oh, that would be gross. What about your what about your work is hard? Yeah. What you do, what problem does it solve? What obstacle does it eliminate? Once it's done, what are people able to go and do? Okay. What do people say about you when you're not in the room? What is the resource that is scarce in your work? Okay. My father, it's Shannon. My father had this term. He called it a foxhole expression, meaning, you know, foxhole in the war. We're in one here. We don't have a lot of time for chit chat. I just have to give you essential information. Go left. What's your, if we're together, what's your, you don't have to tell us all today. What's your foxhole conversation you would have with me? The last three things you're going to tell me before you go. And this is not to tie to what my mom just said. I've used the foxhole thing forever in a day. What's the last, what are the last three things you would tell me if you're not going to get a chance to follow up with me about about what about living your life about just take this to the bank it probably wouldn't be it probably wouldn't be about your work okay it's tied to it though you know i'll answer those questions for myself well what must i do what you tell them to do oh they'll have a better run business with more predictability and more certainty they'll they'll spend way less money and waste way less time blah 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 but really what happens is once all this stuff is eliminated they get to have some really interesting conversations with themselves i create capacity for thought so once you do that first part of the work here's the second thing you do how <laughs> how can i do that and what am i willing to do so my so then my third thing tactically would be just do one small event 
Lori, I would imagine the first time you did one of these, it was terrifying. It's still a little terrifying every week. Absolutely. But you just keep doing it. I love right? it. I and love meeting keep, people. That's it. And you keep refining it and looking at it. So it started with me and this Shannon, my joke early was have two glasses of wine and go for a walk <laughs> is sometimes that helps a little bit getting going to a place to think deeply like a true retreat my partner tom and i under covid we have not we go away every six months for four days and just talk shop with an agenda so like remove yourself completely ask challenging questions. If somebody came in and just said, look, I'm signing on, you'd referenced Kevin McFadden. If somebody just came and said, look, I'm signing on, I'm doing it, here you go. I'm in, I'm in. Start your show. What would you do? What would you be excited to do for them? And that's where it starts. And if you look right on the inside, it's like, I'm just really into cooking. <laughs> it's like, that's a start. Start there. Why? Why? And do you want to share it? And what does it mean to you? And how does it go? And a lot of it too is giving permission, giving yourself permission to, to be uh, authentic, to like what you like. So if, uh, as most people in this room know, I, I, I love to write. If my authentic, if I'm in that foxhole, the last thing I'm doing is making notes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm done. Because that's, that's what I would choose to do. And I can't, Thank you enough for coming in, Dennis. This has been uh, amazing. I didn't know what to expect, quite frankly, and you far surpass any expectations. So thanks for answering my LinkedIn note. I appreciate yeah. that. Well, I'm, way to, I'm glad that you reached out. It's uh, online, virtual is a place that has meaning. It is imperative for all of us to stage experiences that eng engage our clients and give them stages to experience us both both physically and digitally. This works. So I'm, I'm really delighted that you reached out. I enjoyed that. Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody for coming out. If you've enjoyed the show, I hope you'll tell a friend and come back again. Next week, we're uh, talking about more travel shift, right? right? I've got loads of people. I'm sure Andrea and I have talked about this as well. People are just traveling. They don't even know or care if they're going to be covered, what they're covered for. So we need to talk about this shift and, and get people educated and protect it while they're traveling. Thanks so much. Accept this as my virtual handshake and I hope to see you back again soon. Special thanks. Hey, I'm going to high five you over here, Dennis, and, uh, and say thanks for coming in and thanks to everybody. Have a great day.